All Hallows Eve, the evening all your nightmares come to life. All the creatures of the night come out to play. It's time to pay tribute to this terrifying month. So join us as we celebrate a sinister season. This is the Venom Month of Horrors. The Reboot. <laughs> is going on? Rob? It's time, Sean. What? It's time. Yeah, I got that part. Time for what? You have dodged me for long enough. I have? No more running. Who's running? No more hiding. Who the fuck is hiding? It's time. For what? It's time. For a crossover. Okay. What? Okay, fine. Is that really what all this is about? A crossover review? Um, well, well, yeah. Well, all you had to do was ask. You didn't have to come into my home and throw me in a closet. Now I know you won't run away. Why are you so obsessed with this? And why the hell would I run away? We're watching Dreamcatcher. Oh dear God, help, help, get me out of here. This probably isn't gonna work. God help us, this is a bad one. Wanna know how bad? Not only did Stephen King write this shortly after a horrifying car accident in the late 90s when he was messed up on Oxycontin and by his own admission, he didn't even like the book. Not only did Stephen King himself confess that he doesn't even remember writing the novel in the first place. Not only did Stephen King sell the rights to the movie for one dollar. But director Lawrence Kasdan, yes, the writer of goddamn Star Wars and Indiana Jones, and admitted that this movie's failure truly wounded his career thereafter. Mike LaSalle called it a likable disaster. He's the only word likable there, buddy. Shit. Richard Roper claimed, not since death to Smoochie have so many talented people made such a mess of things. Roger Ebert himself stated the movie starts off quite intriguing and couldn't help but ponder what went wrong as it drifted into stunning awfulness towards the end. So we saw just how bad Pet Cemetery 2 was. Jesus, you sat through that as well? Blow me. This is Dreamcatcher. So we do open with some nice and eerie opening titles before cutting to Henry, played by Thomas Jane, a psychiatrist who's also a psychic. A psychiatrist. That's me. And what's the best way to test your psychic abilities? Freak out the mentally ill and push them to suicide, of course. Yeah, this is the introduction to one of our heroes. He blurts out personal stories to terrify the man who's already paranoid, freaking him out. He storms out of the room, and we later find out he practically killed himself. You know, considering we discover these guys have had these powers since childhood, you'd think they would have learned to use them with some kind of subtlety by now. And not be total assholes about it. Yeah, that too. Can you let me out of prison now? No. Oh. It's also pretty symbolic that four minutes in and Henry already wants to get this performance over with. So Henry gets a call from his friend Jonesy, played by the douchebag from Ghostbusters. Actually, it's not the same guy. Seriously? Yeah, I was just as confused as well as how two completely different people can look so similar. Right, this joke failed. Shut it off, shut it all off! How did you know? So Jonesy, who's a teacher of some kind, is also a dickhead as he uses his powers to blackmail his failing students and scares the shit out of them as well. You know, these guys could be using these abilities to, I don't know, stop crime, solve murders, practically save the world. Nah, screw that. Let me fuck with some innocent people's minds. Yes! We then cut to another main character called Pete, played by Timothy Oliphant, who... Always been good at finding <sighs> uses his powers to find a hot woman's lost keys and blackmails her to get a date out of it too. These guys have the greatest gift known to man, a gift we'd all kill for. They have the world's power in their hands. 
and they use it to get laid. Checks out. And look, she is clearly disturbed by this. This whole scene is just awkward and uncomfortable to watch. And we never actually see the date, so we're just going to assume he drugged and raped her. Too far. Well, good luck monetizing this video. Damn it! I never saw anything like this before. So we cut to Jason Lee playing a guy called Beaver. No, really. And it's never explained why. He calls up Jonesy, only to then say it was nothing and immediately hang up. Kinda pointless. Oh, and we're constantly told their little group's catchphrase is SSDD. Same shit, different day. Why is this important? It's not. It has nothing to do with the plot and is entirely pointless. <laughs> I think SSDD really stands for Sean Sniff's Dirty Dicks. <laughs> it just turns my stomach. So Jonesy quickly impersonates Stephen King and gets hit by a car. Um, since they're psychic, shouldn't he have seen that coming? The funnier part is this guy's reaction. Hey! So we randomly skip to six months later and... He's completely fine. Not acknowledged or explained what happened, except that he had a vision of another friend of theirs called Duddits or something, and he motioned for Jonesy to cross the street. He would die before it ever hurt us. So why was he calling me into the street to get hit? Because he knew you'd be dumb enough to walk into oncoming traffic. Me too. So we do get a nice little insight to what Stephen King believes guys talk about when women aren't around. Got blown last night. Good for you. Oh, uh, what's it called when you when you got a constant woody and it won't go down? You mean priapism? See, I'm practically priasmic. <laughs> priapismic. <laughs> Pri Whatever, it's <laughs> hard. That's what you're betting on. I sometimes go for hours talking about my raging hard on. I don't know about you. So this is their annual holiday or something in a cabin in the woods. No, I wish. We do get told that they were on their way to visit Duddits on the night Jonesy got hit, and were then introduced to each of their minds, known as their memory warehouses. The movie's desperate attempt at sounding intelligent. To be fair, there are some nice shots of the memory warehouses looking out at their physical locations. This is our 20th year coming out here to hole in the wall. And fuck me, Freddy, here's to 20 more. Oh yeah, forgot to mention, throughout the movie, Jason Lee constantly says some of the weirdest lingo imaginable. I guess he was trying to be clever, but really it's just weird and unnecessary. And annoying. Jesus Christ, bananas. Fuck me, Freddy. Crime and Netleys. Fuck me, Freddy. This is turning into a double fuck -a Jesus Christ, bananas. Fuck me, Freddy. Bitch in a buzzsaw. Fuck me, Freddy. Fuck me, Freddy. Oh, look, 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 They got dream catchers. That's the name of the movie. What does it mean? Don't know. Never explained. We see dream catchers. Duddits is apparently their dream catcher, but what the fuck does it mean? It's a dream catcher. Uh, Indian charm catches nightmares. And yet this film still exists. So we cut to Maine. Oh. How did I get this? Well, we see the characters as kids. They discover a Scooby-Doo lunchbox owned by somebody called Douglas. Must belong to one of those kids from the Retard Academy. Oh, well, you're a horrible person. They come across some older kids picking on a mentally handicapped boy, but this is one of the cringiest and most awkward scenes ever recorded. The older kids are trying to sound convincing but can't act an ounce, and are nothing like teenagers actually are in the real world where Stephen King clearly doesn't seem to live. And the younger kids just try to sound tough but come across unintentionally hilarious. You better watch it. Why is that? I know who you are. I'm trembling with fear. You're Richie Grenado. You're the quarterback. So? So what do you think people will say when we tell them what we caught you doing? <laughs> Pete Moore. No one can catch him. <laughs> and he's going straight to his house to tell his mother what you did. Was that supposed to be... Some kind of badass threat? Yo! You better give me your lunch money, boy! No, please! Or what? What are you gonna do, sissy? I'm going to tell on you. <gasps> Why? You lose. Why? Because you can't do that! It's wrong! 
Dear God, the scene never ends! It just keeps on going! We're gonna kick your ass! No, you're not! We're going to tell the police! Okay, bye. It shouldn't take this long! But none of it's convincing! The acting, the writing, it's all painfully bad! So the bullies eventually flee as the friends try to comfort the fallen boy. Do something, somebody! If I do... You tell anybody... I'll never hang with you guys again. Wait, what? If I do a nice thing, and you tell anybody I'm not a cunt, I'm not gonna be your friend anymore. At least we know they were horrible people as kids as well as adults. So they sing to him to calm him down, but then... This is where the movie just gets plain offensive to the human brain. Douglas Cavell. That's your name, right? I done it. What? I done it. <laughs> done it? Done it. That's right. They call him Duddits because his speech impediment prevents him from correctly pronouncing Douglas. These are our heroes! Calling somebody by something because of their disability! I mean, I can kind of understand kids doing it, but you'd think they'd realize how awful it is by the time they're adults. But no, they keep doing it into their 30s. And you know, I just have to say, this film is clearly trying to be Stand By Me. Trying being the key word here. You son of a bitch! So we cut to Jonesy hunting for Ghostbusters 2 haters. Hey, you just said he wasn't in Ghostbusters. Shut up, don't ruin this for me. Well, he discovers a fat guy called Rick, lost in the cold, and he's in really bad shape. I knew it. So they take Rick into the cabin to care for him, but they notice something is a bit off. He claims to have eaten some berries, but he can't stop burping and farting, is really ill, and his belly is showing some odd shape. Meanwhile, Henry and Pete are driving along until they come across a body in the center of a road and dodge it to cause another car crash. <laughs> we nearly died. It doesn't matter. Well, that's going on. I guess Noah is walking by as loads of animals pass by the cabin and trying to find the set of Evan Almighty until we- Jesus Christ, now we're back with Henry and Pete. I don't warn you. We get up there and we'll strangle this broad. I had to guess it. Say she's already dead. I don't care. I'll strangle her anyway. She almost got us both killed. Which you found funny just two minutes ago. The woman does, however, wake up, but much like Rick... <clears throat> This is supposedly a scary horror movie, ladies and gentlemen. With farting galore. Be afraid. Be very... <laughs> afraid. Now, I've been told by fans of this shit that it's supposed to be a dark comedy, that it's supposed to be silly, and isn't supposed to be taking itself very seriously. But my problem with that theory is that... It's not. It's not. At only one point in the entire movie, which we'll get onto later, does it ever show some kind of self-awareness in its cheesiness and goofiness. Just one! Hell, I even looked it up on IMDB, on Rotten Tomatoes. Nowhere is it listed once as a comedy. There is no indication that there was any intentional comedy put in here. So if you're claiming it's a dark comedy, I want proof, other than some arguments you've clearly pulled out of your ass. There is no indication elsewhere that it's not taking itself seriously. It constantly does, and gives us ridiculous imagery like this and expects us to digest it without cracking up. Oh, maybe you're right, my friend. Back at the cabin, the animals continue to flee until a chopper shows up and claims the entire area is quarantined, led by Morgan Freeman himself. Look at him, even he's thinking, why the hell am I in this piece of shit? Inside, Jonesy and Beaver discover Rick is missing, and possibly even dying. I'm not all that absolutely positive I want to go in there. What if he's dying? Scooby-Dooby-Doo, we got some work to do now. Yes, we'll take this serious scene seriously now. Seriously. Obviously. But if you think that was silly, just wait until they burst in and discover Rick dead on the toilet with an alien coming out of his butthole. You mean shit weasels? Yeah. What about the shit weasels? So Beaver sits on the toilet to block the shit weasel, while Jonesy rushes out to get some tape. Because clearly an alien that can almost shove a grown man off the john would be blocked by a bit of tape. I mean, that's just physics. As Beaver struggles to hold it down, he calls for Jonesy to hurry up, who signals him with a horn to show that he's in the shed. Why the hell are they doing either of these? I thought they could read each other's minds. In fact, why does anything go wrong in this movie? They can communicate telepathically. And then... 
No word of a lie here. Beaver risks his life to bend down and get a goddamn toothpick. What is this weird, unhealthy obsession he has with toothpicks? I mean, I think they briefly alluded to it in one single solitary scene, but they never gave any indication that he'd risk his fucking life for one. There's a vast difference between OCD and being a fucking moron. Oh my god. Anyway, the shit weasel breaks out, grabs Beaver's crotch, bites his fingers off, and then, despite seconds earlier being able to bite through human bones with ease, it's stopped by a wooden toilet brush. Oh fuck. But Beaver sacrifices himself and tells him to leave him there. But Jonesy's reaction is just hilarious. You killed him. You killed Beaver. I'm really scared. <laughs> Seriously, it looks more like he's laughing. Jonesy is then confronted by the alien who looks like Paul if he was covered in snot and edited by the Spawn special effects dude. But it can turn into vapor and reform itself? How the fuck? Is it an alien or a damn ghost? And I think it gives him a blowjob. When did you see him? They called me in yesterday. I see. And what is the vaunted opinion of those enlightened cocksuckers who've never been within three states of an ET? You know, I struggle to buy Morgan Freeman as a bad guy. I mean, each time he curses, it just sounds like Mickey Mouse swearing, and I can't take him seriously. He even shoots a soldier's fingers off after making him swear Scout's honor, and it's still not very convincing. Meanwhile, in the freezing cold, Pete is specifically told to not return to the car for beer. So, of course, he returns to the car for beer. Pretty stupid, considering alcohol lowers your body temperature. And then this is where the film just gives up. It is literally aliens coming out of people's buttholes. Where at any point is there any indication that this is self-aware? Where is the indication that this is actually a comedy? Because we can't see it. Ah, here it is. So Jonesy is now possessed by the alien ghost thing called Mr. Grey. I hope he's not gonna tie someone up and perform BDSM in the snow. Although... I don't like this. Me neither. I don't like this at all. But Jonesy, or Mr. Grey, is fucking hilarious. He becomes all smiles, speaks in an English accent, and you can tell that this was intentionally funny, and it works. Are you speaking to me? Yes, I am, Mr. Jones. Or is it Jonesy? That's what your friends call you, isn't it? It's just the rest of the film that sucks. While that madness is going on, Pete is drunk and talking to the dead chick, even revealing that Douglas gave them their psychic abilities when they were young. You know, if someone gave me psychic abilities, not only would I treat them with a little more respect by not calling them their incorrect name caused by a mental deficiency, but I also would not stop talking to them for years on end. These people are scum. They make fun of his name, they use their powers to manipulate the innocent, and they even neglect the kid who gave them the powers to fucking begin with. Go to hell, you scum! He also claims that they read each other's minds, yet they never actually use these powers when they could do with them. Anyway, he pisses Douglas's name. Classy. How can he even do this so perfectly whilst drunk? Before the very phallic looking shit weasel pops out and bites his cock. Because, well... Gotta make the male audience members squirm a little bit, I guess. This is a very serious horror movie, folks. An alien swinging around on a penis. But Pete does what any normal man would do, and dry humps the fire to kill it, before popping right back up. Um, no? How about- Ow, my balls! I'm never having kids! That's right, my man. Meanwhile, Henry is walking around when- Jonesy, way to go, motherfucker! Here, you come to save the day. Now he can read Jonesy's mind, but he couldn't earlier for some reason. But he soon realizes it's Mr. Gray and somehow quickly hides in the snow in a split second. Can't Mr. Gray read minds too? Wouldn't he know that he was hiding there? Nah, I don't even give a shit anymore. So we get clips of Mr. Gray choking Pete with the force? So he's an English butler with the force. And they want me to take this seriously? I can try, but... Mm, nope, sorry, not happening. And while this is going on, Jonesy is shouting out from his memory warehouse because the writer thinks he's clever, despite the fact that these shots are entirely pointless. I mean, we know Mr. Gray is taken over against Jonesy's will, so we know he's opposed to it. We don't need to see him screaming out, no, leave him alone. Wow, he can shoot awful CGI out of his finger. 
Neat. So Mr. Gray tries to reach a certain part of Jonesy's memory, while Henry returns to the cabin and immediately gets out a shotgun. Wait, so why the fuck did they waste so much time getting the tape to seal the alien earlier when they could have just shot it? What the fuck is wrong with these writers? Uh, Sean, are you okay? No, I've gone completely insane! So he shoots the alien and... His acting is hilarious! <laughs> Henry then gets a vision of what's happened to Jonesy, but how is he seeing this? Are these part of the powers? Because this was never established, nor is it ever explained. I mean, sometimes they can do something and other times they can't. Anyway, he decides to dispose of the shit weasel and all of its eggs by setting the cabin on fire. Yes, it did indeed have eggs. Apparently the gestation period for shit weasels is about 30 minutes. And if it can reproduce by laying eggs, what's the point of the Ripley? To rip off great James Cameron films. Noted. So long, Beef. Love you, man. We didn't, because you were an asshole. We then get a really weirdly timed flashback to the kids again, who still playfully call him Duddits as if it's not insanely offensive. She's the one from the Retard Academy. Oh, and you're still a horrible person. So this is where they're all given their superpowers. Well, time to ditch him for 30 years. Let's go, fellas. The duo bond together to help a small girl who's trapped, but her acting is so bad. Her screams for help are so enthusiastic. It's like Willy Wonka let her out of his factory. Help! And I can't even root for these kids because they're such horrible people. And if you thought these characters couldn't possibly be any more one-dimensional and uncreative, Morgan Freeman literally says he's evil. He literally says he has no other character traits or personality outside of being evil. Now, if anybody's thinking why those poor helpless little folk, all naked and unarmed beside their crashed intergalactic way they may go, what kind of a dog, what kind of a monster could hear that heartbreak and go in just the same? Well, I'm that dog. I'm that monster. I'm evil and I have no other personality. I have to say, the aliens are calling to the humans and pretending they need help and that there's no infection. Yes, it's a ruse, but wouldn't it have been far more interesting and a really cool swerve if the aliens actually were friendly and Mr. Gray was the lone wolf who inadvertently drove the human army to commit genocide? Nah, shut up, Sean. Man, what does he know? Who the fuck? Are you? So Morgan Freeman and his minions blast the aliens away, but it's portrayed like this is wrong. I mean, the aliens are the bad guys. Y you know that, right? Meanwhile, Pete informs Mr. Gray that Douglas was actually warning them about all of this in the past. Gee, if only there was a way for them to communicate telepathically all this time. If only. Oh well, who cares? Pete dies. Well, Jonesy continues to watch from his memory warehouse, still trying not to laugh. Oh, and we get more pointless shots. Don't talk to him, get out of there! Thanks for that. So Mr. Gray hitchhikes and gets picked up, but this dude is an awful actor. A fucking giant alien appears, and he doesn't even look shocked. Oh, that's just annoying. Meanwhile, Jonesy begins moving all the things from his mind that involve Douglas to his secret room. Sorry guys, but Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind will do a far better job the following year. Henry gets picked up and taken to the quarantine area where he shows off his supernatural powers of... giving Morgan Freeman a headache. What are the rules for these powers? They're about as consistent as the Terminator timeline. I'm fine, I'm fine. I must be getting too old for this shit. <laughs> Just add lethal weapon to the list. What's up with these bizarre camera angles? It's the only time Morgan Freeman looks scary, but it's on this weird tilt, and I still can't buy him as evil. What are you gonna tell Rita about what you did here, Owen? What are you gonna tell Katrina when she's old enough to ask? That I killed aliens and saved the world? So Henry proves to Morgan Freeman's sidekick that he can read minds, sometimes anyway, and blackmails him to help him find Mr. Gray. You and I don't get after him right away. He's gonna get out of my range. Oh, so their powers are restricted by range. One, they waited an hour and 39 minutes to tell us this. Two, what stopped them before when they were just a fucking room away? Get in! You almost ran me down. I figured you'd read my mind and get out of the way. He's right, you know. You know, I bet you're right. So Jonesy somehow uses a phone inside his memory to call Henry in reality. And Henry answers, 
Using a gun? How can this be taken seriously? I don't understand! That's just stupid! And dangerous! What if they're still around left in the chamber and you accidentally pull the tree? On second thought, go ahead, Henry. And his acting is atrocious! Jonesy! Jesus Christ, I knew it was you! Where's he taking you? Massachusetts. So we find out that when Jonesy got hit by that car, somehow it prevented Mr. Gray from obtaining a certain section of his brain. Never explained how. Nothing. So they head to Douglas's house and even his own mother, his own mother, fucking mother calls him Duddits. Are you kidding me? For real? Rob, calm down. His own mother! I mean, it's one thing for them to do it, but his own mother who's raised him and named him Douglas, and even she makes fun of his disability. That it's, that it's, that it's the disabilities. Do you know how people live with this shit? It's not fucking easy, and this movie's making fun of them. Fuck this film. Fuck Stephen King. It's okay. It's almost over. No, the, da the damage is done. We then get this shocking realization that Douglas knew about all of this from the start. And a flashback confirms this, but anyone with a brain noticed it the first time we saw the scene. Yeah, Henry here realizes that Douglas actually said something else, Mr. Gray instead of mystery. But we can understand him perfectly clear the first time because I guess we're not offensive cunt wombles. Stop trying to sound intelligent, movie. You're not. Oh yeah. We find out Mr. Gray plans on releasing the shit weasels after letting one pop out of a dog's butthole. And it just keeps getting better. Into the local water supply at the nearby reservoir. Morgan Freeman soon shows up. Apparently he just waltzed into a chopper hellbent on destruction and nobody stopped him. And he goes all machine gun on his man and misses every single shot. You know, for a military man, he's a pretty lousy aim. He's even standing completely still. What is even the plan here? They're all trying to kill the aliens, so why are they attacking each other? It doesn't make any sense. And the soldier, you know, a military man, without even taking cover, somehow single-handedly shoots down a helicopter on his own, murdering Morgan Freeman once and for all. Meanwhile, Mr. Grey takes about seven weeks to open a fucking manhole cover before Henry shows up and is attacked by the alien. It turns out he too is a lousy aim, until the dumbass shit weasel jumps right onto the barrel of the gun. I must admit though, it, it did look pretty cool. Let's be friends! So Henry and Jonesy square off, but he needs confirmation that it's him and not Mr. Grey. Can't Henry just read his mind to see if it's Mr. Grey? He was able to do that earlier. Who cares? Douglas shows up to save the day. We will be doing. We have some work to do now. Okay. That was the one time that line worked. That was fucking badass. So Henry stands there watching Douglas being attacked and just sort of screams and doesn't do anything. Eventually he gets stabbed and only then decides to turn into this huge alien creature thing, kills Mr. Grey, and that's it. The film just ends before we get this bizarre montage of the characters behind the credits for some reason. But if Douglas was an alien the whole time, What's the deal with his mom? Was she an alien too? Nothing is explained and it just ends immediately after the climax with no resolution whatsoever. But who cares, it's over! That was Dreamcatcher! By God, it was bad! I didn't think I'd make it. What a train wreck this movie is, which is kind of surprising given the people involved. You wouldn't think a screenplay written by Lawrence Kasdan and William Goldman could suck, but here we are. Granted, I've not read the book, so maybe the source material wasn't very strong to begin with. King was dosed up to the eyeballs on Oxy when he wrote it, after all. Or perhaps it was good, but just doesn't adapt well to film. Actually, in the book, Douglas doesn't even kill the alien by himself. Him and Henry use their powers to smother it with a pillow. That's stupid! You're too messed up to know what you're saying. Whether the book is to blame or not, the bottom line is the film didn't work. It did have a few things going for it. The cinematography is outstanding and the acting was pretty good for the most part. Morgan Freeman in particular made a great villain, though let's face it, Morgan Freeman makes a great anything. And Donnie Wahlberg was surprisingly good as Douglas, but the story was pretty weak and horribly contrived. The effectiveness of the boy's alien mind powers constantly changed for plot convenience, and I can see why. 
If it didn't, we wouldn't have a movie. They could simply use their mind-reading powers to figure out what was going on, telepathically alert each other, and get the fuck out. The end. And it seemed to me that they were really trying for a Stand By Me vibe with these characters, but that movie had a certain charm to it that was sadly not present here. My recommendation, skip it. You're not missing much. The movie is just a mess. The acting has a few drops every now and then, but it's basically solid. I disagree about Freeman and couldn't really enjoy him as a villain, but the rest were fine. It's just a messy, inconsistent screen play that tries to be taken seriously and fails constantly. None of it makes sense and it tries to be so many other films at the same time simultaneously forming a cluster fuck of a horror movie. And there we go, we finally got a crossover! Yeah, so now can you get the hell out of my house? Until next time! What's next time? Oh, you'll see. Just kidding, I have no idea.